Hey, it's Steve Mignani here doing the Junkyard Crawl at Bernardston Auto Wrecking in Bernardston, Massachusetts with a 1957 Chrysler Windsor two-door hardtop. Now, 1957 was the first year for Chrysler's forward look sweep spear styling, where Virgil Exner, the chief stylist, his vision really came to fruition. Uh, and at first, these cars were revolutionary, but 57 was an interesting year. While the cars had the fins and the sweep spear styling that Virgil Exner espoused, 57s had single headlights, not the quad headlights, at least for the beginning of the year. This is a Johan Chrysler New Yorker right here. This is a Johan uh, DeSoto Sportsman. We can see these are from Johan, which of course means John Hanley. They're friction promos. These would have been given away at a dealership to Little Junior, and Johan used to say the little ones help sell the big ones. But with that said, about halfway into 1957, most states said, okay, quad headlights are all right, bring them on. And thus for 57 mid on through, 58 we see quad headlights. And again, this is a 1958 with the quad headlights, but it's interesting to see how the 57 fender is formed and had a single light right here, the big six incher, uh, but it was formed because Chrysler stylists knew that quad lights were coming and indeed they came to reality in 58. But again, this is a, an amazing piece of American post-war sculpture. The bumper is massive, all steel. These little character bumps right here don't do anything at all, but accentuate the width of this front bumper by giving points of reference for your eyeball to soak into. Again, the uh, extruded aluminum grille, gold iridite Windsor, crest in the center. And keep in mind that Chrysler went uh, from the top New Yorker, 300D muscle car, Saratoga, and Windsor, which was the entry-level car. And something that was really cool about uh, all Chryslers in 57, inc including Dodge and Plymouth and DeSoto and Imperial, was the way they had California custom styling touches, deeply hooded headlights, pancaked hoods, which means no more ridge in the middle, no more hinge in the center. It was pancaked, it was flat, and it looked kind of like something George Barris might have come up with in Southern California, but again, right at your Chrysler dealership. And by contrast, I have to say that General Motors was very much caught unawares. This is a 57 Chrysler. That's a 57 Oldsmobile. Got to say, the Olds is interesting. But the Chrysler just comes off looking far more modern. You know, it's longer, lower, wider. This is also a Johan promo right here. But again, the Oldsmobile by 1959 would have a whole different look, as with the Chevrolet, the Olds, the Pontiac, etc. Influenced by Chrysler, really. This is a very influential car in many, many, many ways. Now, under the hood of this thing here, uh, these ordinarily open from the front, but this one's bunged, so the back opens here. It's not a Thunderbird, but underneath we would see, okay, no engine here, but this does have torsion bars, second year for them, that long rod going under the car. That doubles as the front suspension. In any other car, that would be a coil of spring steel. Does the same job, but a torsion bar gives perhaps a more level ride, less body roll. This one was born with power steering, power brakes. That Bendix booster right there is a pretty rare piece. So this thing would have had power brakes, again power steering, pretty well loaded. And again the Windsor was the entry level uh, Chrysler. So again most likely to be cheap but again no six-cylinder Chryslers after 1954. Uh, and again the Windsor and the Saratoga had a 354 cubic inch engine but it wasn't a Hemi. It was a Poly. Uh, the upper, the Imperial, and of course the New Yorker, and the 300D would have had a 392 Hemi. But again, the Windsors had poly engines, more on that in a second. And this is, of course, the two-door hardtop. And these are very rare cars. In fact, there were 265,500 Windsors built in 58. Only 6,205 were two doors like this one. Very rare. Again, 6,205. And they were all hard tops. No sedans, no posts. Again, there were two convertibles built, by the way. This ain't one of them. But this is a 1958 Chrysler line brochure here. And we can see right here, they're totally bragging. Four headlights, folks. Look at that. The most, the biggest thing you see is those quad lights, new for 58. Glamour car of the forward look. Let's open it up and see what we get. Kind of a cool pull out here, introducing the bold new look of success. And again, the flight sweep styling, the fins, 12 glamorous models, three series, New Yorker, Saratoga, Windsor. Doesn't mention the 300D, but it was certainly part of the picture. Inside here, here's more of it. Select the model you like from three great series 
and a new wider price range. You can see right here the uh, idea uh, with the uh, springs, the Torosinia ride. We'll talk about that in a second, what that means. No dive, no uh, rear end dip on acceleration. That has to do with the leaf springs. We'll get to that in a second. But the push button torque flight transmission right there in its infancy right here, three speeds, one, two, and drive. Center plane brakes on the right hand side there. And on the far right, there it is, that gold thing. That's the 392 Hemi found in the Imperial, the New Yorker, and the 300, whereas the, uh, the Saratoga and this Windsorwood had a 354 Poly. We'll talk about that in a second. There's nothing with, with uh, Poly wants a cracker, not a parrot, but here's the whole lineup, New Yorker, Saratoga, and Windsor. And again, only 6,205 Windsor two-doors were built. Very rare body style. And the convertible Windsor, two were built. Crazy but true. Now getting back into this one, this one did have the rib raker rear view mirror. This little thing right here is where the, oh, okay. Yeah, that little knob right there. Let me, let me correct myself. The rib raker wasn't yet. The rear view is up high. There we go. But shortly thereafter, the rear view would come out of the top of the dash, which was considered to be a, a modern styling touch, but was pretty bad if you get into an accident. Uh, this one was a radio equipped car, pretty sure. The push button torque flight pod's been removed from the left-hand side of the instrument panel. But again, this is a two-door hardtop. What a sleek, beautiful greenhouse this is. I dare say it's about as nice is a 62 Chevy Bel Air bubble top, as graceful. Big wraparound rear window glass right here. And again, Virgil Exner's fins in their second year. They get a little wacky in 59, 60, 61, but man, what a beautiful thing this is right here. Windsor, and again, the Windsor Castle, complete with uh, the little turret. Now getting back to what is a poly? Well, we see the polyspherical cylinder head up here. And while a hemi has a hemispherical combustion chamber, the polyspherical is this deal right here. We can see that the valves are kind of in a hemispherical orientation. They're kicked. So the exhaust valve opens straight down. The intake valves opens at an angle away from the cylinder wall so it's not as shrouded. But again, the polyspherical com combustion chamber gives some of the benefit of a hemispherical combustion chamber without one key thing, the need for double rocker shafts. On a Hemi, there's two rocker shafts, one for the intake side, one for the exhaust. It's expensive and it's heavy. Meanwhile, the poly combines the angles so that they all converge with one rocker shaft. So this is a cheaper version, gives some of the breathing benefits of a Hemi without the expense and the weight of double rocker design. So that's what the poly is right there. These would have sat atop the 354 short block and that 354 short block's big with drag racers with a cam and piston change. It's the same as the Hemi. Getting back into the trunk, of this thing. This one would have been the basic two barrel with 290 horsepower. Here's that cast iron manifold. And the poly was an interesting engine because the intake manifold served as the tappet cover. This device right here bolts down between the cylinder heads. Pretty good sized ports. They're not too bad. Uh, and again, this is a two barrel right here. An optional four barrel went from 290 to 310 horsepower on that 354. Poly. And here is Motor Trend, speaking of the uh, design of this car. And do I hear a, a self important whining sound? Anyway, October 57 Motor Trend with the big Edsel on the cover, but you know, bigger fins for Chrysler. Chrysler was also making news. We have it here on page 40. Let's have a peek what they're talking about. And here it is artists' renderings right here. Chrysler's theory of success, style and continue to style cars that are three years ahead. The year 1957 saw dramatic changes in the automobile industry, but none quite so exciting as the sudden resurgence of the Chrysler Corporation to a position of serious competition. That this did happen after years of decline in Chrysler's percentage of total sales is vindication of the theories of a small group of men who were betting their careers that a completely new approach to styling could bring the company out of its slump. Virgil Exner. And interesting, too, to note, Bob Cumberford, that's the guy who wrote this, Robert Cumberford today, same guy, a highly regarded stylist and writer, into a thing called Cumberland or Cumberford by Design for Automobile Magazine and for Sports Car Market, still alive and well critiquing designs. But again, this article here shows us artist renderings of how Chrysler, you know, decided that uh, 
the theory here, it says here, Virgil Exner, a designer of considerable experience and taste, Exner has just recently been elected to vice president of Chrysler Corporation, again, October 57. As public acceptance of these cars increased, so Exner's personal prestige grew within the organization. Their goal was to make Chrysler the absolute leader, and their methods were radical. The stylist requested an overall height reduction of five inches versus 56. The engineering department was reluctant, but styling was able to get management behind their cars, so the many and difficult engineering problems were attacked. And that's the whole punchline, you know, the flight sweep styling, lower, longer, wider. And it really worked until it didn't. One of the problems with these cars was they were hastily built, they tended to rust within a year or two, and the public quickly realized the build quality just wasn't there. So these became, not the laughing stock, but pretty much unpopular. But for 1958, Chevrolet freaked out. Their new Impala, the brand new X-Frame cars, uh, by 1959, that whole thing was gone because it looked like a brick compared to these things. GM was running scared because of a small group of Chrysler stylists. Crazy but true. It ain't happened. It's not the only time that happened, by the way. The Ram truck, the Charger, the Challenger, sometimes a little guy can lead the way. But anyway, looking further on this thing here, this is an odd thing. This is the Chrysler Ball and Trunnion drive shaft. At the rear, this goes into the differential, the usual cross U-joint routine, nothing radical there. But at the other end, on all Mopars up till 1965, uh, when it finally changed, this is the Ball and Trunnion. And this is basically allows uh, movement, but inside of this is a cross shaft with two balls and they ride in these grooves. You can kind of see what's going on right there. And this was uh, kind of a nuisance to work on, but again, these were used in Max Wedge cars, race hemis. In 65, they finally went to the slip yoke, which is kind of the industry standard. But Chrysler had this ball and trunnion and stuff for many, many years. And another thing, too, about Chrysler, that's unique and novel, getting back to that, uh, that suspension they were talking about, the anti-squat on acceleration. This is a Chrysler leaf spring right here. Uh, this is the front end. That's the back end. We notice right here, this is the pin, the central line where the axle lives, right there. Notice how it's not halfway down the spring, but a third of the way back, like that. What that does, it makes the front segment of the spring stiffer, so that's like a traction bar. So when you punch the gas, it's less likely to do a wrap, whereas on a GM or a Ford leaf spring, the pin is usually right in the middle, which sets up the spring for a sine wave. So Chrysler leaf springs, because the axle is a third of the way back, not half. These are kind of inherently better at taming axle hop and giving you good launch characteristics without die or squatting or wheel hopping. So again, it all started in 57 with the flight, uh, the air flight suspension system, as they called it, torsion bars up front, leaf springs in the back with uh, shorter segments up front. That's the magic right there. The super stock leaf springs in the 60s were based on this very same design. And it's why the Max Wedges and Race Hemis hooked and boogied as well as they did. Now getting down to this side here, you know, we see again the original black paint on this. Uh, it's a mixture of beautiful preservation and horrific decay. You choose which one you want. And let's open this door. Oh, yeah. And there is the impaler. That's the steering column right there. Of course, that if you hit that in an impact, uh, it's coming through. <laughs> You're going to make sparks on your vertebrae. But again, automotive safety wasn't really a priority at this point in time. The idea was that you would avoid a crash instead of having it. Good luck with that one. But here's the starter right here, 1956, first year for 12 volts. This is the massive Chrysler starter right here. And this is a beast of a thing. It's cast iron. And again, this would feed into the torque flight and fire your motor right up. Cast iron stuff. Of course, the aluminum, the starter would go to an aluminum back here, like in the, in the mid 60s. But again, a monstrous direct drive right there. So anyway, here we have it, second year. For Virgil Exner's forward look. Again, 354 power, but don't call it a Hemi. The winds are in the Saratoga. Got a junior Hemi, the Polisphere, right here. Now, if you like this video, be sure to give us a thumbs up, share it with your friends, hit the like button, and be sure to ring the bell so you're aware of the next video, which comes out tomorrow morning.